Hello class, <clears throat> this is Fire Service Hydraulics and Water Supply, Chapter 9, Fire Department Pumper Testing. After completing this lesson, you will be able to describe the types of pretests conducted for fire department pumpers and the components for fire service testing. In this chapter, we're going to cover the following objectives. First, we will identify the types of pretests for fire department pumpers. The second learning objective will be to identify the components of service testing for fire department pumpers. Right now, we're going to start with objective one, which is to identify the types of pretests for fire department pumpers. With pre service tests, this, these are done to ensure the apparatus has been constructed according to the purchaser's specifications and will perform as intended. This must be required in apparatus with bid specifications used to purchase the vehicle. Otherwise, the manufacturer may elect to skip them and purchasing department will have no way of knowing if the apparatus meets the requirements necessary for that particular jurisdiction. Pre-service tests can be grouped into three categories, manufacturer's tests, a pump certification test, and then an acceptance test. Most pumping fire apparatus are designed to meet the requirements of either the NFPA 1901, which is the standard for automotive fire apparatus, NFPA 1906, which is the standard for wildland fire apparatus, or NFPA 414, which is the standard for aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicles. The specs should state that the failure to meet the NFPA requirements will be one cause for rejecting the acceptance of a particular apparatus. NFPA standards for pre-service and service tests are minimum requirements. The fire department has the option of placing more stringent requirements in its specifications. The more stringent the requirements, the fewer manufacturers will be likely to bid on apparatus. The manufacturer and or representatives of underwriters laboratories typically perform pre-service tests. Fire department personnel usually only observe these tests, though in some cases they may be physically involved with acceptance testing itself. The purchaser of an apparatus may require any type and number of manufacturer's tests. If the apparatus bid specifications include requirements of NFPA standard 1901 as a minimum manufacturer is required to perform two specific tests, the road tests and the hydrostatic test. NFPA standard 1901 requires manufacturer to perform a road test on the vehicle to ensure that it will safely operate once it is fully loaded with equipment and personnel and placed into service. Before starting this test, the apparatus is fully loaded in the same manner as it would be once it is in service. And this includes making sure that all agent tanks are full and it involves the weight of all personnel, hose and equipment that will be carried on the apparatus. Those all have to be accounted for. Test weights, which may be used in lieu of personnel, hose and equipment are sometimes used and the sum of the test weight must equal the sum of the real people and equipment. Test weight should also be located where the real weight will be distributed throughout the apparatus. Most manufacturers have a closed course driving area where they conduct tests. If that's not available, then care will be used to choose a location that will not cause the driver to violate any applicable traffic laws or motor vehicle codes. The test surface should be a, fly, a flat, dry, paved road surface that is in good condition. Sometimes it's a skid pad, for example, what you see here. NFPA standard 1901 requires apparatus to meet following the following minimum criteria during road tests. The apparatus must accelerate to 35 miles per hour, 56 kilometers an hour, from a standing start within 25 seconds. This must consist of two runs in opposite directions over the same surface. The apparatus must also achieve a minimum top speed of 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour. The requirement may be dropped for specialized wildland apparatus that are not designed to operate on public roadways. NFPA standard 1901 requires apparatus to meet the following minimum criteria during road tests. 
and this is continued from the previous slide. The apparatus must come to a full stop from 20 miles an hour, 32 kilometers an hour, within 35 feet or 10.7 meters. The apparatus parking brake must conform to specifications listed by the braking system manufacturer. The fire department may choose to include in the specs a road test requirement that exceeds NFPA minimums. When addressing these special situations, performance-based specs are better than engineering-based specs. Performance-based specs simply say what you expect the apparatus to do, and engineering-based specs are simply a list of vehicle components with which the purchaser is requiring the manufacturer to construct the apparatus. The pitfall of engineering-based specs is that manufacturer may follow them to the letter, but the finished apparatus may not be able to meet the purchaser's actual operational requirement needs. If a manufacturer can demonstrate that it followed engineering-based specifications, the purchaser then has no recourse. With performance-based specs, the outcome is clearly defined. In other words, this is what the purchaser expects that apparatus to do. Either the apparatus performs as desired or it does not if not, the purchaser can refuse to accept the vehicle until corrections are made and the apparatus then performs as desired. The hydrostatic test determines whether pump and pump piping can withstand normal operating pressures. It involves filling the pump and piping the water through and placing external pressure source on it. NFPA standard 1901 requires the pump to be hydrostatically tested at 250 PSI or 1,750 kilopascals for three minutes, three sustained minutes. During the test, the tank fill line, tank to pump line, and bypass line valves all should be closed. Discharge valves should be opened and capped. Intake valves should be closed and or capped. If any compartment of the pump fails during the three minutes of the test, the apparatus will not be certified. The hydrogen hydrostatic test, excuse me, determines only if apparatus, fire pump, and piping were constructed and assembled properly. The pump certification test will determine if then the assembly operates properly. The tests ensure the fire pump system operates as designed after it is installed on the apparatus chassis. Certification tests must be required in the apparatus bid set specifications. Although tests may be conducted on manufacturer's site, they are not considered manufacturer's tests because most purchasers require independent testing organization or organizations to conduct them. Some fire departments have tests performed after the apparatus has been delivered. However, if the truck fails and requires substantial repair or re-engineering, it will have to be returned to the manufacturing facility. The pump certification test assures the fire department and insurance rating companies that the apparatus will perform as expected after being placed into service. The results of these tests must be stamped into a plate that's then affixed to the apparatus's pump panel. NFPA standard 1901 requires the following pump certification tests. A pumping test, pumping engine overload test, pressure control system test, a priming device test, a vacuum test, and finally a water tank to pump flow test. NFPA standard 1901 specifies conditions under which the pump certifications must be conducted. These tests must be carried out from a static water supply source, and a static water supply source must be at least 4 feet or 1.3 meters deep. The strainer must be submerged at least 2 feet or 0.65 meters below the surface of the water. The surface of the water may be no more than 10 feet or 3 meters below the center line of the pump intake. 20 feet or 6 meters of hard intake hose should be used for drafting during testing. Now we will talk about the pump certification tests. The requirements for environmental conditions under which the tests must be conducted include an air temperature between 0 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 18 centigrade and 43 degrees centigrade. Water temperature should be between 35 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.67 degrees centigrade and 32 degrees centigrade. The barometric pressure 
and the atmosphere must be at least 29 inches or 737 millimeters of mercury corrected to sea level. The barometric pressure is the least considered environmental factor, but it is likely to have the greatest effect on the test's outcome. Each 1 inch 25 millimeter drop in barometric pressure reduces a pumper's maximum possible lift by about 1 foot or 0.3 meters. The elevation affects the pump's performance in much the same manner. A pump's ability to lift water from a static water source decreases by about 1 foot or 0.3 meters for every 1,000 feet or 300 meters in elevation. Elevation also affects gasoline engines adversely, although they are rare, more rare in modern fire apparatus. On average, gasoline engines operate about 3.5% less efficiently for every 1,000 feet or 300 meters increase in elevation. Now this table is the NFPA standard 1901 that specifies minimum hard intake hose arrangements for tests on pumps of varying capabilities. So it shows the radiocapacity, capacity, the suction hose size, the number of suction lines in case of the test there's only one. Well, in any time you're doing a pump like this, there's only one line. And a maximum lift in feet or meters. This is the remainder of that table. So it goes all the way up to 3,000. Conducting tests in an elevation of more than 2,000 feet or 600 meters above sea level may necessitate increasing the intake hose diameter, the number of intake hoses used to pump rated capacity, and laying out a variety of discharge hoses and nozzles will also be necessary to complete the pumping certification tests. NFPA Standard 1901 requires that during testing, the entire apparatus must be maintained in an operating condition like that which would be expected during normal fire ground operations. All normal electrical loads on the chassis and equipment should be imposed during pumping tests. Any engine driven accessories must also be operational. Structural enclosures that would not be open or removed during fire operations or normal operations must remain in place. Pumping test verifies the pumping system will perform at its rated capacity over an extended amount of time. For an apparatus that's equipped with a fire pump rated at 750 gallons per minute, 3,000 liters per minute or greater, the entire pumping test takes about three hours. The apparatus shall continuously pump its rated volume capacity at 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals net pump discharge pressure for two sustained hours. The apparatus shall continuously pump 70% of its rated volume capacity at 200 PSI or 1400 kilopascals net pump discharge pressure for one half sustained hour. And then the apparatus shall continuously pump 50% of its rated volume capacity at 250 PSI or 1750 kilopascals net pump discharge pressure for a sustained one half hour. The pump must not be stopped at any time during the two hour portion of the test except to clear the suction strainer. The pump may be stopped between the three various tests to clear the strainer or change hose and nozzle arrangements. The volume discharge pressure, intake pressure, and engine speed in RPMs should be recorded every 15 minutes for the duration of the testing. At the end of the test, figures need to be averaged to determine the rated capacity of the apparatus, and then the figures are then stamped onto the pump panel test plate. The test process for apparatus equipped with pumps rated at less than 750 gallons per minute or 3,000 liters per minute is essentially the same except for time intervals. The apparatus will, shall continuously pump 100% of its rated volume capacity at 150 psi or 1050 kilopascals net pump discharge for 30 sustained minutes. And then the apparatus shall continuously pump 70% of its rated volume capacity at 200 PSI or 1400 kilopascals net pump discharge for 10 minutes. And then in another test, the apparatus shall continuously pump 50% of its rated volume capacity at 250 PSI or 1750 kilopascals net pump discharge pressure for one half sustained hour. The volume discharge pressure, intake pressure, and engine speed or RPMs should be recorded every 10 minutes for the duration of the testing. Now the pumping engine overload test is performed only on an apparatus equipped with fire pumps whose rated capacity is 750 gallons per minute or 3,000 liters per minute or greater. 
In FPA standard 1901 requires the test to be performed immediately following a two hour portion of the pump test. During the overload test, apparatus is required to pump 100% of its rated volume capacity at a pressure of 165 PSI, which is 1155 kilopascals net pump discharge pressure for at least 10 minutes. The volume discharge pressure, intake pressure, and engine speed in RPMs should be recorded at least three times during this test period. Fire pumps equipped with pressure control systems ensure that dangerously high pressures do not build up in the pump when the discharge lines are closed and that the pump remains engaged. Pressure relief systems activate appropriately and reduce train dangers of overpressurization. And the procedure for conducting pressure control system tests during the pump certification testing is the same as that conducting during annual service testing. The priming device test check the pumps, checks the pump's ability to evacuate water from the pump, piping, and intake hose so that it may draw water from static water supply source. Because all pumping certification tests are conducted from a static water supply source, most testing personnel will perform this test before the pumping test, which requires that the pump be primed. Before the test begins, all intake valves must be open all intakes must be capped or plugged, all discharge caps must be removed, and the primer may then be operated. Pumps with a capacity of 1,250 gallons per minute or 5,000 liters per minute or less are what is tested, and in that test, a time required to achieve a prime should not exceed 30 seconds. Pumps with a capacity of 1,500 gallons per minute, 6,000 liters per minute or more should be measured as the time required to achieve a prime not exceeding 45 seconds. A pump with a 4 inch or 100 millimeter or large auxiliary intake with piping volume of more than 1 cubic foot or 0.3 meters cubed, in that case an additional 15 seconds is allowed. During this test, the priming device test, a pump must obtain a maximum vacuum of at least 22 inches or 500 millimeters of mercury. The only exception is if the test is being conducted at an elevation greater than 2,000 feet or 600 meters. In that case, the maximum vacuum can be reduced by 1 inch or 25 millimeters of mercury for every 1,000 feet, 300 meters, above 2,000 feet or 600 meters, not above sea level. The vacuum test is performed to ensure that there are no air leaks within the pump, piping, and intake hoses when preparing to draft from a static water supply source. Air leaks prevent the primer from creating the partial vacuum required to draw water into the pump. The procedure for conducting the vacuum test during pump certification testing is the same as it is for conducting it during annual service testing. The water tank to pump flow test in this case, most fire incidents are handled successfully by simply utilizing water carried on board apparatus water tanks. But it is crucial that the apparatus be tested to ensure water will flow from the water tank into the pump at a sufficient rate to ensure adequate supply to fire streams. NFPA standard 1901 states that tank to pump piping should be sized so that pumpers with a capacity of 500 gallons per minute, 2,000 liters per minute or less, can flow 250 gallons per minute, 1,000 liters per minute from their booster tank. Pumpers with capacity greater than 500 gallons per minute or 2,000 liters per minute should flow at least 500 gallons per minute or 2,000 liters per minute. The procedure for conducting tank to tank pump flow tests during pump certification testing is the same as it is for conducting it during annual service testing. For acceptance testing, this is not required or outlined in NFPA standard 1901 or any other standard. This is conducted at the discretion of the purchaser alone to ensure the apparatus meets the bid specifications once the apparatus is delivered. Though tests could be conducted at manufacturing facility, it is advisable to conduct them within their jurisdiction where the apparatus will be placed into service. This ensures the apparatus will perform as specified in that jurisdiction. This is particularly important when the fire department's jurisdiction varies widely, excuse me, 
varies widely from manufacturer's location as these may impact the apparatus's pumping facility. For instance, you may buy an apparatus that's manufactured at 50 feet below, above sea level and you're going to be using it in an area that's 3,000 feet above sea level. So that ha obviously, as we know from all of the material we've covered thus far, has a great impact on the apparatus. With acceptance testing, the types of tests, test criteria, and personnel performing the tests may vary widely within local jurisdiction preferences and conditions. All of these details must be covered in the bid specifications and the contract for constructing the apparatus so the manufacturer knows what will be expected. Regardless of the tests selected, representatives of the manufacturer, purchaser, and testing agency, if there is one, must all be present during testing. At a minimum, acceptance tests should include other pumping tests, even if a certification test was performed at the factory. The pump test does not have to include mirror certification tests, but rather may follow the service test procedure. This should be proof enough that certification test was accurate. If an apparatus fails to perform according to acceptance testing requirements that are detailed in the bid specifications, it should be rejected. The purchaser is letting the manufacturer know that the apparatus will not be accepted and paid for until the original specifications are met. In some cases, conditions can be made by the manufacturer's representative on site. In serious cases, the apparatus may have to be returned to the factory for additional work. Some review questions. Who is responsible for conducting a road test? That is on page 198 and 199 of the manual for the answer if you're looking for it. And the next question, how does the pump certification test different from, differ from a hydrostatic test? That's on page 201 of your text. Next two questions, on which apparatus would a pumping engine overload test be performed? That is on page 204 of your manual. And when do most personnel perform a priming device test? That is on page 205 in your manual. Last review question for now, where is it advisable to perform an acceptance pretest? That is on page 206 in your textbook. Learning objective two will identify the components of service testing for fire department pumpers. The need to verify a v an apparatus's operational capabilities certainly does not end once the apparatus is placed into service, which is why we have service testing. The service test establishes that the apparatus continues to function in the required manner and that must be verified periodically throughout its service life. Service testing of apparatus periodically and after any major repair work is crucial for several reasons. First and foremost, the lives of firefighters who use the apparatus are highly dependent on its ability to perform its job, as is the property that the fire department protects. The insurance rating system used to evaluate protection levels in communities requires proof of testing to give the fire department and the community maximum allowable insurance grades or ratings. The requirements for service testing fire department pumping apparatus are contained in NFPA standard 1911, which is the standard for the inspection, maintenance, testing, and retirement of in-service automotive fire apparatus. This standard requires the pumper to be service tested at least once a year and any time it's undergone extensive pump or powertrain repairs. Service tests are necessary to ensure the pumper will perform as it should and to check for defects that otherwise might go unnoticed until it is too late. IFTSA's Fire Department Pumping Apparatus and Aerial Driver Operator Handbook organizes all requirement elements and outcomes contained in NFPA Standard 1911 into a logical sequence in which they may be carried out. The engine speed check, vacuum test, pumping test, pressure control test, gauge and flow meter test, and the tank to pump flow rate test. Site considerations for pump service tests are generally the same as considerations for pump certification testing. Because many fire departments do not have fixed facilities that manufacturers typically have for conducting these tests, some elements will require extra thought and planning. Performing service tests will necessitize laying out enough discharge hose and nozzles to pump the rated capacity of the fire pump. 
minimum size hose that may be used for this application is two and a half inches or 65 millimeters, although larger hose may be used if available. Whatever hose is used, it must be tested to ensure it can withstand the discharge pressures during the pump test itself. Site considerations for pump service tests. You must scribe a mark where the hose and couplings meet. See how he's scribing the hose there with that tool. While the pump testing is proceeding, make sure to regularly check the couplings to ensure that the hose is not starting to pull loose of the coupling. So you can see in the illustration, there is going to be a little bit because the fire hose stretches out when water is flowing through it. So you can see that while the pump test is proceeding, you want to make sure that the hose is not starting to pull loose the coupling. If it moves more than 3 eighths of an inch, stop the test and replace the hose. In this case, um, you can see the scribe mark has moved back from the coupling. As long as that's not more than 3 eighths of an inch, you're good to go. This is a table 9.2a, which is the customary hose and nozzle layouts for pump tests. And this is the remainder of that table. Make sure, like all tables that I mentioned, that you go back and review these and know where to access them. This is 9.2b, which is the same thing, it's just in metric scale. And this is the remainder of table 9.2b. NFPA standard 1911 requires elements of the service test be conducted at pressures of the following net pump discharge pressures. 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals, 165 overload PSI or 1155 kilopascals, 200 PSI or 1400 kilopascals, 250 PSI or 1750 kilopascals. This is correcting the net pump discharge pressure for the test. The net pump discharge pressure is the total work done by the pump to get water into, through, and out of the pump. When pumping from a pressurized water source, the net pump discharge pressure is less than the pressure shown on the discharge pressure gauge. When at draft, the net pump discharge pressure is more than the pressure shown on the discharge gauge. This is due to pressure losses from lift and friction inside the hard intake hose that's being used to draw water into the pump. Because most pump testing is done from draft, when tests are conducted, allowances for friction loss in hard intake hose and the height of the lift must be determined. Because of these calculations and you don't have time to perform them at the actual test, you use these tables where it's been calculated out. And this is table 9.3, which is the friction loss in 20 feet or 6 meters of hard intake hose, including the strainer, from a draft water supply source. This is the remainder of that table, 9.3. And this is the very end of the table itself. So it's spread over three signs. Make sure you access and review this in your book and how it figures into correction for net pump discharge pressure from the tests. These allowance that we just covered on the previous three slides on the table are then used to ascertain the correct pump discharge pressure during each test. The following equation is what calculates these pressure corrections. For U.S. customary, it is, or imperial system, it is pressure correction equals lift in feet plus the intake hose friction loss divided by 2.3. The corrected pressure is subtracted from the desired net pump discharge pressure to determine what the pump's actual discharge pressure can be. For example, 150 PSI minus 8 equals 142 PSI or 1050 kilopascals minus 56 kilopascals equals 994 kilopascals. Of course, they got the values for metric from the table that outlines these corrections, pressure corrections in metric. And this is the same as, in, as it is in metric. So these allowances are used to ascertain the correct pump discharge pressure during each test. And for metric, you have the pressure correction. And it's the same formula, it's just in metric. So you have lift in meters plus intake hose friction loss divided by 0 
and the corrected pressure is subtracted from the desired net pump discharge pressure to determine what the pump's actual discharge pressure can be. For example, 150 PSI minus 8 equals 142 PSI as it was in Imperial and for metric again it's 1050 kilopascals minus 56 kilopascals equals 994 kilopascals. So in this example they got the values from that table that we just reviewed on the previous slides. So here's an example. You have a 1000 gallon per minute pumper being service tested. The lift is 9 feet through 20 feet of 5 inch intake hose. You have to find the necessary pressure correction from this test. From table 9.3, the friction loss allowance for 20 feet of 5 inch intake hose is 8.4 feet. Therefore, here's your formula again, pressure correction equals lift in feet plus intake hose friction loss divided by 2.3. So if you plug in the values from this example, your pressure correction is 9 plus 8.4 divided by 2.3. And when you factor it out, you get 17.4 divided by 2.3, which is 7.56 to 8 PSI. This is the same example in metric. In this example, a 4,000 liter minute per minute pumper is being service tested. The lift is 3 meters through 6 meters of 125 millimeter intake hose. Find the necessary pressure correction for this test. From table 9.3, which is the pressure correction table in metric, the friction loss allowance for 6 meters of 125 millimeter intake hose is 2.6 meters. Therefore, here's your formula again, pressure correction lift in meters plus intake hose friction loss divided by 0.1. The pressure correction when you plug in the values equals 3 point plus 2.6 divided by 0.1 that gives you 56 kilopascals. The nice thing about metric is you don't end up with lots of decimal places. So instead of the value being a rough, you know, approximate value in metric, it's 56 kilopascals. There's a variety of both special and standard firefighting equipment that will be required to perform all elements of a service test. Any equipment used to perform a service test must be in good shape, properly calibrated, and tested regularly, or else accurate test results cannot be expected. The following equipment is needed to perform a service test for pumpers. You need to have a gauge to check pump intake pressure. This gauge should have a range of 30 inches or 750 millimeters of mercury to zero for a vacuum gauge or 30 inches or 755 millimeters of mercury vacuum to 150 psi or 1050 kilopascals for compound gauges. The gauge to pump discharge should be capable of a range of at least 0 to 400 psi or 2800 kilopascals. The following equipment is needed to perform service tests for pumpers. And this is the remainder of the list we started on the previous slide. You need also to have a pitot tube with a knife edge and air chamber rated at least from 0 to 160 psi or 0 to 1120 kilopascals. Note, this is not needed if a flow meter is used. Some more equipment that will be needed to perform the service test for pumpers is a solid stream nozzle or a set of solid stream nozzles of correct sizes to match the volumes pumped for different tests. Note here, if a flow meter is used, the fog nozzles may be used provided they are rated for the necessary flows. You also need for the service test rope, chain, or a test hand for securing the test nozzles as you see illustrated in the picture here. You also need a revolution counter or a hand tachometer and fire department or insurance agency forms. Those are crucial because you're going to record data on there that are being used for future test comparisons and also for the insurance underwriters to make sure that the equipment is still falling within the required specifications and insurance underwriting guidelines. 
There are several other pieces of equipment, although they're not required, that may be useful during service testing and are recommended to have on hand by IFSTA. Two six foot or three meter lengths of one and a quarter inch or six millimeter 300 PSI or 2,100 2, kilopascal hose with screw fittings. Note, these are used to connect the test gauges to the test gauge fittings at the pump operator's panel. You need a clamp to hold the pitot tube to test the nozzle, test stand for the gauges, a thermometer to verify water temperatures, and a stopwatch or wristwatch that shows the time in seconds. A flow meter may be used during a service test instead of a pitot gauge arrangement to determine the flow from nozzles. This allows more flexibility and helps to complete the tests more quickly. When used, all pump tests can be run without shutting down the pump, without changing nozzles, and without having to convert pitot tube pressure readings to gallons per minute. If used, they must be calibrated to the manufacturer's specifications, that being flow meters. Safety precautions that are necessary during a service test mean that all personnel should wear protective headgear and hearing protection if exposed to noise more than 90 decibels. And remember that sound is going to be sustained over a long period of time, so it can really do damage to the ears. Also, um, a precaution must be taken to prevent water hammer by opening and closing all valves and nozzles slowly. Never stand over or straddle hose and make sure to manipulate the engine throttle slowly. Also, another precaution is to prevent sudden pressure changes that can damage equipment and injure personnel. Tie down vest, uh, excuse me, tie down test nozzles and devices must be secure. Cover all manholes, open manholes at the test pit and be aware of the location of all personnel in the test area in relation to hose lines. For the engine speed check, the first test that should be performed is an engine speed may be checked by the tachometer on the engine and or a properly calibrated handheld tachometer or revolution counter. The engine speed should be checked under no load conditions to ensure the engine is still running at a governed speed for which it was rated when the apparatus was new. If it is not running at the correct speed, no further testing should be started until a qualified mechanic corrects the situation first. For a vacuum test, this is performed to check the priming device, pump, and hard intake hose for air leaks. This test is performed first because it will be difficult to proceed if the apparatus cannot hold an appropriate vacuum. For the vacuum test, step one involves making sure the pump is completely drained of all water. Step two means that you must inspect all gaskets of the intake hose and caps. Step three, make sure to look for foreign matter in the intake hose and clean the hose if necessary. Step four in a vacuum test involves connecting 20 feet or six millimeter, I'm sorry, six meters of correct intake hose to the pump intake connection. Check the original test records for correct hose di diameter. And step five, cap the free end of the intake hose, just like you see in the illustration on this slide. Step six in the vacuum test means to ensure that all intake valves are open and intake connections are tightly capped and all discharge valves are closed and their caps removed. Step seven, connect an accurate vacuum gauge or mercury manometer to the threaded test gauge connection on the intake side of the pump. There's an illustration of one of these um, manometers in this picture here. Caution. For a vacuum test, if the gauge is mistakenly connected to the discharge size, it will be irreparably damaged. So be sure you're connecting it in the right place. Step eight in a vacuum test, check all oil level in the priming pump reservoir and replenish it if necessary. Step nine, make sure that pump packing glands that are accessible for checking by raising the floorboards or the open compartment doors. Step 10, run the priming device until the test gauge shows 22 inches or 550 millimeters of mercury developed. Note, reduce the amount of mercury developed in one inch or 25 millimeters for each 1,000 feet or 300 millimeters of elevation. We talked about that earlier in the chapter. Step 11 in the vacuum test involves making sure to compare readings of the apparatus 
intake gauge, and test gauge record any difference. Step 12, shut off the engine and listen for air leaks. No more than 10 inches or 250 millimeters of vacuum should be lost in five minutes. Excessive leaks will affect results of subsequent tests and should be located and corrected before performing the rest of the tests. When it, doing a vacuum test, if the apparatus cannot reach 22 inches or 560 millimeters of mercury, it should be removed from service and repaired as soon as possible. Following completion of vacuum tests, preparations should be made for conducting the remainder of tests. This involves step one, opening the discharge valve or drain to allow pressure in the pump to equalize. Step two, replace the cap at the end of the intake hose with an intake strainer. Step three, use standard departmental procedure to tie off the intake hose in preparation for drafting. Then lower the hose into the water. Remember that the strainer should be at least two feet or 0.6 meters below the surface and at least two feet or 0.6 meters of water also should surround the sides and bottom of the strainer. Step four, connect the discharge pressure test gauge to the pressure side of the pump at test fitting on the operator's panel. Step five, connect enough hose lines to carry the capacity of the pump to the test nozzle. The test nozzle must be the correct size to handle the capacity of pump, and that is in table 9.4. Step six, make sure the nozzle is secured so it cannot come loose and injure personnel. Never hold the test nozzle by hand during a test. Step seven, connect the pitot gauge and test stand gauges. It is recommended that a pitot gauge be clamped in position at the nozzle. This is table 9.4 that I mentioned. This is the flow in gallons per minute from various size solid stream nozzles, and it gives you the nozzle pressure and PSI and down the side and the diameter in inches across the top. This is the same table in metric. The pumping test checks overall condition of the engine and pump. This test is like the pump certification test. The primary difference is in duration of each of the various steps of the testing process. Obtaining the correct engine and nozzle pressures for a pumping test requires adjusting and readjusting. During the pumping test, all changes must, made, must be made slowly to prevent damage to the pump and hose, to avoid possible injury to personnel, and allow time for resulting pressure changes to register on test gauges. Step one in the procedure for pumping test means you gradually speed up the pump until the net pump discharge pressure is 150 psi or 1050 kilopascals, adjusted for intake hose friction loss and elevation. If the pump is a two-stage pump, transfer valve must be in a volume or parallel position. This portion of the test measures the apparatus's ability to pump its rated volume capacity at 150 psi or 1050 kilopascals. Step two, check the flow at the nozzle using either the pitot gauge or flow meter. If the flow is too great, close a valve further and readjust or lessen the engine speed to correct the discharge pressure if the flow is too low, open a valve further and readjust or increase the engine speed to correct the discharge pressure. Note, all of these adjustments must be made within the engine speed not exceeding 80% of its peak. Step three in the procedure for pumping test, when both the pump discharge pressure and flow volume flowing are satisfactory, the test officially begins. Record the readings at the beginning of the test and at five minute intervals hereafter until the 20 minutes sustained duration for the test are over. You want to record the pump discharge pressure, nozzle pressure or flow, engine tachometer, RPM using portable RPM counter, engine coolant temperature, that's optional, oil pressure is optional, and automatic transmission fluid temperature, that's optional. Fluctuation and pressure necessitate more frequent readings because you want to know how often those fluctuations are occurring. If you have one or two random um, fluctuations, that's one thing. If you have several or more than several, that's another. So it's very important to record fluctuations and pressure readings. Step four in the pumping test procedure 
once the 20 minute capacity test has been completed, the net pump discharge pressure should be increased to 200 PSI or 1400 kilopascals. At this point, the pump should be delivering at least 70% of its rated volume capacity. According to NFPA standard 1911, a two-stage pump transfer valve may be in either volume, parallel, or pressure series position for this portion of the test. The pump should be allowed to run at this setting for 10 minutes with 200 PSI, which is 1400 kilopascals, to, at 70% readings listed above verified at five minutes, and then again at the conclusion of a 10 minute period. Step five, once the 200 PSI or 1400 kilopascal test has been completed, the net discharge pressure should be increased then to 250 PSI or 1975 kilopascals. At this point, the pump should be delivering at least 50% of its rated volume capacity. The two-stage pump transfer valves must be in the pressure or series position for this portion of the test. The pump should be allowed to run at this setting for 10 minutes with the 250 PSI or 1975 kilopascals at 50% readings listed above verified at five minutes and then at the end of the 10 minute period. Some additional guidelines while performing the pump test are to hold the pedal gauge with the blade opening at the center of the stream like you see in the illustration here. The distance from the blade's tip to the end of the nozzle should be about one half the diameter of the nozzle. So you can see he's this is a pretty um, small nozzle so he's holding it one half the diameter of the nozzle so that pedal blade is pretty close to the end of the discharge uh, from the nozzle. Additional guidelines to consider while performing the pumping test are to keep the engine temperature within proper range, check the oil pressure to be sure proper engine lubrication is maintained, record any unusual vibration of the pump or engine, and record any other defect in performance of the pump or engine, and then correct minor defects immediately if that's possible. Pressure control device or devices should be tested to make sure they maintain a safe level of pressure on the pump when the valves are closed at a variety of discharge pressures. All pressure control readings should be operated according to manufacturer's instruction during this testing. Pressure control test follows a three-part sequence. So for the pressure control test, step one, set the fire pump so it is discharging its rated volume capacity at the net pump discharge pressure of 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals. Step two, set the pressure control device to maintain discharge pressure at 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals. Once the device is set, close each flowing valve one at a time. Close each valve in no less than three seconds and no more than 10 seconds. Step four, observe the pump discharge pressure gauge. It should rise no more than 30 PSI or 210 kilopascals when all the gauges are closed. Note, when closing a valve in less than three seconds, that can damage the pump piping or pressure control device. Closing it in longer than 10 seconds will not test the pressure control device realistically. So you just need to close it down slowly, but make sure you do so in more than three seconds and less than 10 seconds. Part two of the pressure control test. Step one involves a setting fire pump so that it's discharging its rated capacity at a net pump discharge pressure of 150 PSI, which is 1050 kilopascals. Step two, reduce the pumping engine throttle until the net pump discharge pressure drops to 90 PSI or 630 kilopascals with no change to the discharge valve or nozzle setting or settings. Step three, set the pressure control device to maintain the discharge pressure at 90 PSI or 630 kilopascals. Step four and part two of the pressure control test. Once the device is set, close each flowing valve one at a time. Remember to close each valve in no less than three seconds, no more than 10 seconds. Step five, observe pump discharge pressure gauge. It should rise no more than 30 PSI or 210 kilopascals when all gauges are closed. Note, closing a valve in less than three seconds, just to remind you, again, can damage the pump and piping. So make sure you close it between three seconds, longer than three seconds, and less than 10 seconds. Step one, part three of the pressure control test. 
set the fire pump so it is discharging 50% of its rated capacity of net pump discharge pressure of 250 PSI, which is 1,975 kilopascals. Step 2. Set the pressure control device to maintain the discharge pressure at 250 PSI, which is 1,975 kilopascals. Once the device is set, close each of the flowing valves one at a time. Remember, in no less than 3 seconds and no more than 10 seconds. Step 4. Observe the pump discharge pressure gauge. It should rise no more than 30 PSI or 210 kilopascals when all gauges are closed. And this is just again to remind you, closing a valve, don't do it abruptly in less than 3 seconds and don't do it so slowly you go longer than 10 seconds. For the discharge pressure gauge and flow meter operational tests, this next portion of service test procedure involves checking the discharge pressure gauges and flow meter to make sure the driver operator is getting accurate discharge information when the pump is in operation. If these devices are not working properly, the driver operator could supply dangerously insufficient or excessive amounts of water to firefighters operating the hose streams. Testing of apparatus discharge pressure gauges is a relatively quick and simple process. Each of the discharges on the apparatus must be capped to perform this test properly. This means pre-connected hose lines must be disconnected and caps or closed nozzles screwed onto the discharges. This is an example of reminding you how it should look when the discharge is capped off. Once all discharges are capped, each discharge valve should be opened slightly. The throttle should then be increased until the test discharge pressure gauge reaches, reads 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals. A quick visual inspection of master discharge pressure gauge and each individual line discharge gauge should reveal all to be at 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals. Gauges should then be checked at 200 PSI and 250 PSI, which is 1400 and 1,975 kilopascals and in the same manner. Any gauges that are off by more than 10 PSI should be recalibrated, repaired, or replaced. Testing flow meters is pretty straightforward. When testing discharges equipped with flow meters, it is not quite as simple a process as testing the pressure gauges, but it's pretty straightforward. To test the flow meter, a hose line equipped with solid stream nozzle must be connected to each discharge being tested. The discharges do not have to be tested all at once. The minimum flow rates that must be achieved for each listed pump discharge piping sizes for the test to be valid are listed here in Table 9.5. This is the minimum flow for measuring points for flow meters. You've got your pipe size in inches and the test flow in gallons per minute. The actual flow when testing flow meters will be calculated using pitot tube readings taken from the discharge of solid stream nozzles. The flow meter from the nozzle and a reading on the flow meter should not differ by more than 10%. If the difference is more than 10%, the flow meter must be recalibrated, replaced, or repaired. A tank to pump flow test must be conducted on all apparatus equipped with a water tank regardless of the size. The purpose is to ensure the piping between the water tank and the pump is sufficient to supply a minimum amount of water that is specified by NFPA 1901 and the design of the manufacturer. NFPA 190, standard 1901 states that tank to pump piping should be sized so that pumpers with a capacity of 500 gallons per minute or 2,000 liters per minute or less can flow 250 gallons per minute or 1,000 liters per minute from their booster tank. Pumpers with capacities greater than 500 gallons per minute or 2,000 liters per minute can flow at least 500 gallons per minute or 2,000 liters per minute. Some departments may specify a greater flow rate when they order an apparatus from a manufacturer. If that was the case with the apparatus that's being tested, this test should be performed for the higher figure. For the tank to pump flow test procedure, step one involves making sure that the water tank is filled till it's overflowing. Step two, close the tank fill line bypassing the cooling line and all pump intakes. Step three, attach sufficient hose lines and nozzles to flow the desired discharge rate. Step four, with the pumping gear, open discharge or discharges to which hose or hoses 
is or are attached and then begin flowing water. Step five, increase the engine throttle until maximum consistent pressure is obtained on the discharge pressure gauge. Step six, close the discharge valve without changing the throttle setting and refill tank. The bypass valve may be temporarily opened during this operation to prevent the pump from overheating. Step seven, reopen the discharge valve and check flow through the nozzle using a pitot tube or flow meter. Adjust the engine throttle if the pressure needs to be brought back to the amount that's determined in step five. Step eight, compare the flow rate being measured to the NFPA minimum or the manufacturer's designed rate. If the flow rate is less than this, a problem exists in the tank to pump line. The minimum flow rate should be discharged continuously until the tank is at least 80% emptied. So reviewing the test results. At no time during service testing procedures should the pumping system or pumping engine show signs of overheating or power loss or any other type of mechanical problem. All calculations and figures determined during the test must be recorded so they can be filed according to department record keeping procedures. And insurance may have a separate form. So you may have one for the department and one for insurance. But both copies should be kept in the department. Further, when reviewing the test results, if the fire pump underwent certification testing and now tests to less than 90% of its capabilities when it was new, there are two options available. First, take the pump out of service and restore it to its design capabilities, and most jurisdictions prefer this, or give the pump a lower rating based on test results. Troubleshooting during service testing. There are almost an endless array of pitfalls that may occur when doing service testing. It's a complex operation, so it, things can happen. Personnel performing tests should be familiar with these potential problems and their causes and or appropriate solutions. This following table that we're going to cover lists potential problems and solutions that may be used when troubleshooting during service testing operations. This is table 9.6, some service test troubleshootings. You might have a problem with turbulence or whirlpooling in the static water supply source. And this table lists, lists the causes and solutions. This is another problem, pump cavitation, and its cause and solution are listed. Again, this is table 9.6. Some further problems, low maximum capacity readings or inability to hold prime. Again, table 9.6. And some other problems are pump panel tack shows different lower RPMs than the dashboard tachometer or inability to perform 250 PSI at a 50% volume test. So the, all of these are table 9.6. These are service test troubleshooting of things that can occur during service testing. And this is some more problems, lower than normal pressure and volume output or reduction from proper pressure and volume capacity to less than that over the course or during the test, the course of the test. Every effort should be made to correct any problem that is found. The portion of the test that was unsuccessful should be redone to ensure that the problem has been connected, corrected. Excuse me. Review questions. Remember these are on quizzes and tests. Why is it important to have periodic service testing for fire apparatus? That will be on page 206 of your manual. Next question, when performing a test pump from a draft, how does the net pump discharge pressure compare to the pressure shown on the discharge pressure gauge? That will be on page 208 of your manual. Next question, list at least four pieces of equipment required to perform a service test on a pumper. That is on pages 210 through 1014 of your text. And when covering, or excuse me, when performing a pumping test on a two-stage pump, what position should the transfer valve be in? That will be on page 217 of your text. Next review question. If a fire pump that underwent certification testing tests to less than 90% of its capabilities than when it was new, what is one option available to address the issue? Remember, there are two options. So you need to know them both if the question on the test asks you what is one of what is one option? That is on that information is on page 222 of your manual. 
Class, this is a long chapter with a lot of technical data. Make sure you review the tables. Know which table tells you what. And should you need any assistance, be sure to contact your instructor as we always advise. Thank you for your attention. We will meet again for chapter 10.